What? All right. Uh, welcome to ConCon, episode two. Uh, ConCon is consciousness conversations where we talk about all things consciousness, neuroscience, AI, etc. Um, I'm DR. I'm a product manager and consciousness enthusiast. Uh, I'm Ben, and I'm a senior research scientist at NVIDIA. In AI? In AI. Yeah. So uh, if you listened to the last episode, you heard Ben dropping all sorts of GPT-4 uh, and AI references. Um, so uh, he's very up to speed on all that stuff. So today we wanted to talk a little bit more. Um, if you listened to the last episode, you heard us reference a lot um, Solms and Graziano as kind of this uh, duo. Uh, they actually have nothing to do with each other, I think. <laughs> I don't know that they would class themselves together, but I think both of us feel like... I, they, they should, though. They should, right? They I, should I actually think they're, they're somewhat complementary views of a, sim a very similar idea. Yeah. And, you know, we talked... I mentioned briefly that, like, neither one of these guys or people in their spheres tend to go to, like, the con this consciousness conference that we're going to go to. Um, so it's just, it's interesting. So, um, Mark Solms is this South African guy. I think he's the founder of this like neuro psychoanalysis study. So, uh, society, so he kind of comes out of the um, psychology realm and Graziano is more neuroscience. He's like a Yale, um, Princeton, Princeton, uh, professor. Um, okay. So, but before we get into that, we wanted to talk about, um, lay some foundation of some of the, um, kind of like big thought experiments and discussions that are happening in con in the conscious space in the last, I don't know, 50 years, I guess. And so we wanted to start off by talking, well, I don't know, do you want to say anything else first before we did dive into it? Yeah. Although I, I will say that like some of these big ideas they think are, are actively um, damaging to the cause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we yeah. can talk about that too, but uh, de definitely they, it's like a things like zombies or the hard problem or things that you essentially at some point have to discuss. Yeah you can't ignore because um, it's sort of like the main or the dominant way of that people yeah. have been talking about this for a while. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of some of these arguments remind me of like uh, behaviorism, which is like the dominant um, view in psychology for like, I don't even know a hundred years or something BF Skinner stuff. And the idea that like, you know, all human behavior was just motivations and could be trained. And every single book I've read recently from like, you know, the, the moral animal to like behave Robert Sapolsky, they're all just like, all they do is just like this destroyed us for this. Set Wait, us back. Solms also spends a lot of yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. I think almost that. everybody, everybody yeah. talks about how, what a bad misstep this was. And I think some of these things like the hard problem may be classed in a similar, in a similar way. Um, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So we want to talk first about this um, essay. Uh, it's in this book uh, I'm holding up if you're watching us on YouTube, Good uh, the mind's eye, um, lots of fun stuff. And, but it's also, I think it was published in various places, but it's called what it's like to be a bat. Um, do you want to kind of summarize the essay or talk about like what the implications are? Yeah. I feel like this essay does get lumped in with like Chalmers hard problem stuff a lot, but I actually think it stands on its own it predates that significantly. I think, um, Thomas Nagel's like 74, an, I want to say. It came yeah. Out. Yeah. I think it did really, it, 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 it's just a really eloquent way of talking about the weirdness of, um, qualia, qualia. Does he use the word qualia in that old essay? I don't Probably know. not, but like sort of the ineffable subjective experience of things. And he uses the bat in particular because it has a sensory modality that's super alien to us, but, but it's also a mammal, but it's also a mammal, right? So it probably, there is something it, feels like to be a bat and that seems to be fundamentally differentiating from like what you would say about like a rock it seems yeah. like there's nothing like it is like to be a rock but there's something it's like to be a bat and that definitely depends on its uh, sensory input of course yeah so i think it's just exploring these fundamental notions of like the weirdness of the feeling of uh sort of processing your own sensor data yeah yeah, and it's kind of, I think it's a rare, maybe, th in that space, or it was so popular and, and evocative because it was so simple. It was just sort of saying, like, let me define consciousness as what it feels like to be something, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think the, so so now, so let's go from that to the hard problem. So the well, hard, yeah, actually, okay. let's, let's linger slightly. So I think another thing, I think he does take a, the position of that maybe science can never answer these questions. Yeah. Right. So he goes a little bit one step farther and he says, it seems like this uh, inward experience that things have 
uh, might fundamentally stand in contrast to how science works. Yeah. Um, and there may be no experiment to directly get at the inward experience. And also, of course, all we have in some senses inward experience of these uh, external experiments we're doing. So there's like this sort of mind trapped in a vat yeah. issue. Which seems unlikely to be true to me that it's un unsolvable in the sense that like, you know, if you imagine a future of us getting better at simulating um, uh, conscious entities who have emotions similar to ours and could th those emotions could then be modulated in certain ways or different modalities were introduced of like, oh, you have echolocation now or now you have no sex drive or now you have hunger that's ravenous. And like, what does it feel like to be that entity for some period of time and how do you uh, adjust to your world? Like that's, you know, there is an ineffable quality to the feeling, but it's also like, you know, a qu quantifiable. It's like when you go to the hospital, they're like, you're in pain, you get a pain score. It's like that pain score is like totally subjective. But over time, what I've found, I don't know if other people have found this, but like as you go back to the hospital, now every time I go back and they ask me how, what, how, what's the pain score out of 10, now I've developed a rubric for myself of what that means. And now I'm like, oh, I'm seven out of 10. And I don't know, I've had conversations, it just happened the other day where someone's like, oh, it was like eight out of 10. Like I should know exactly what that means, even though our subjective scale might be wildly different. Yeah, it reminds me. Okay, so there's an experiment. Um, I can't remember the details, but I'm probably going to give enough information that you could Google it. But there, I think there are indirect ways of even getting at that problem, like the relative subject, subjectivity. And there was this um, experiment where basically everybody eats spicy food, and they rate on a scale of like 1 to 10 of how spicy they think it is. Um, and then they also, I think more importantly, are are subjected to a sound where the decibels change and they have to sort of match the spiciness to the loudness of the sound. Oh, interesting. And incredibly... So two two modalities that are fun, theoretically subjective and you're kind of like... Kidding. Yeah, so, but you're like, you hear a certain loudness and you're like, okay, that loudness is roughly like what I consider the spice level of this pepper. But what they found interestingly is the loudness of the sound that people stopped at correlates actually with how much they're able to taste the spicy. Because you can look at how many taste buds people have or whatever. Mm. And so it, it seems to me that there are, is a certain type of experimental setup that does actually get at sort of the intersubjectivity of people's experiences. But you have to do it in a roundabout way, and you could say, well, is there a correlation or decorrelation with the senses? And like, so is this valid? But like, I think there are ways to get at this. Yeah. But maybe we're deviating too much um, from our initial <laughs> outline, which was to say that Thomas Nagel sort of set the stage for subjective experience or even defining consciousness as something it is like to be something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's, let's pop into then um, the hard problem. So this guy, David Chalmers, who does go to all these consciousness conferences, like I remember when we first started getting into this space and he seemed like this mythical creature, he kind of like... I don't know, he's getting pretty old now. He's got like super white hair, but he always would he would always like wear a leather jacket and he's like got this long kind of mangy like rock star kind of vibe to him. And I think uh he definitely <laughs> <laughs> He's like a mangy Bon Jovi. He's a mangy Bon Jovi, yeah. <laughs> well, that came up in a chat thread or something, right? I didn't, I, I didn't. Um <laughs> But um yeah, he he got it so 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 he sort of says, All right, the easy problem and, and this would be my subjective take on this, but I feel like now that now this thing's been kind of gone rogue and it's, you know, these have their, their own space in the wild. But like the, the easy problem is kind of like the neural correlates of consciousness. What is our brain doing? Like we could figure out what it means to um, where where consciousness is arising or how it's arising in the brain. But the hard problem is why should it exist at all? And. This is sort of like... Or what does it feel like anything to be conscious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. W why does it feel like anything, right? And so, and I feel like the... And Chalmers, importantly, is a philosopher. And I feel like this is a very... You know, so so the, the space, like the three people we're talking about come from wildly different academic disciplines who are all studying the same thing. And I think that's kind of telling that the philosopher would sort of have this like mic drop thing, like, oh, this is the hard problem. And um, I have a couple quotes I want to read about this. Um... And I would say, in general, the people that we find really compelling sort of seem to say, like, this isn't, this isn't interesting to talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it's kind of like the, the mystery of it is from its definition. But yeah. its definition is sort of uh, fundamentally misconstrued. I, I think that 
the hard problem should neither be considered hard nor a problem. Right? Yeah. It's sort of like what the people I, I think we lean toward uh, are sort of on that take, on that side of things. Because I think you can always define an undefinable problem, right? Yeah. And then be like, well, you can't define it. Like, but, but you've defined it as undefinable. Um, I think there's actually a lot of interesting ways you can tackle the hard problem as well to show that it's not hard nor a problem. Um, are you going to give a quote for uh, pro? I, is it I, a I've, got, quote? I've got two quotes. I'm not going to give any Chalmers quotes. I think okay. he needs no, <laughs> no fuel on his fire. So I have um, one quote from Anil Seth who is, he has a, um, he's a, like a, I would say a current kind of consciousness luminary. His book is called Being You, which I have not read, but I'm, it's on my, it's on my list. Um, and wait, is that what it's called? I don't remember. It, it is. I ha- I haven't, I have yet to read also it. Read it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I actually I'm going to start reading it next. Um, and he wrote this article. This is Aeon Magazine, Eon Magazine, however you say it. Um, and he's like, it's not about the hard problem. It's about the real problem. So here's a quote. Uh, but there's an alternative, uh, which I like to call the real problem, how to account for the various properties of consciousness in terms of biological mechanisms without pretending they don't exist, the easy problem, and without worrying too much about explaining its existence in the first place, the hard problem. And then he goes on to say there are some his- historical parallels for this, uh, for this approach, for example, in the study of life which I hadn't really thought about this, but once biochemists doubted that biological mechanisms could ever explain the property of being alive. Today, although understanding remains incomplete of this, this initial sense of mystery has largely dissolved. Biologists have have simply gotten uh, on with the business of explaining the various properties of living systems in terms of underlying mechanisms, metabolism, homeostasis, reproduction, and so on. An important lesson here is that life is not one thing, rather as many potential separate aspects. So we don't have this animus life force, this ethereal yeah. thing uh, driving us. It's just basic biochemical processes. And, 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 and each of them is like kind of separately interesting and uh, complicated, but it's like what is alive and what isn't alive is like not that interesting of a, of a problem to talk about. So, so we've talked about this concept before, but the, the God of the gaps yeah. problem <laughs> where like if you're a religious person and you just put God wherever um, you find mystery... And then that mystery later gets uncovered by scientific principles. It eats away at your belief in God. And I think that there's a similar God of the gaps oh, yeah. thing going on with consciousness where it's like, okay, here's this a hard problem. spooky, weird thing. <laughs> yeah, but but I think we're going to see it. The problem will dissolve and we'll see it never was a problem in the first place. Yeah. Like, or it wasn't even a, a valid thing to ask questions in the manner that we were asking questions. Yeah. All right, I wanted to read, and now we're going we're gonna to get more into Psalms, but I want to read his, um, his take on this as well. Let's see. Um, so th- he's talking about, you know, hey, we think we've kind of like solved this problem. And he's really saying that the, um, the, the way the problem is defined doesn't lend itself to, to being quote unquote solved. So I said, let's see. So he's talking about some work he did with Carl Frist. And sure enough, when Friston and I received our first peer review, uh, first peer reviews from the Journal of Consciousness Studies. That's exactly what one of them said of our article. The hard problem following Chalmers is a metaphysical problem and as such is not open to being, quote, solved. Um, and then he, he says, to be fair to Chalmers, he's not responsible for the philosophical prejudice, prejudices that troubled uh, these colleagues. Um, yeah, so it's like, let's see. Yeah, and, and he, so he says up here, it's like, unfortunately, the hard problem of consciousness will probably never completely disappear because we'll always have its most committed supporters. I mean, it's a religion. It's at, a religion. At some point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder about this consciousness conference if it's going to be a lot of sort of um, zealous, uh, like quasi-religious type views on consciousness. There, there was a um, interesting religious, um, it was like spirituality session that was um there was actually a person from BYU uh that did a study that made me very upset <laughs> but there was a a guy from NYU who had like had a divinity degree and it it was like pretty interesting but i think what in general that i would say the overarching this is from last year right we'll see what happens this year but the overarching theme was sort of like leveraging altered states of consciousness in order to understand kind of the 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 bigger picture and a big avenue for that is psychedelics Another avenue for that is sort of like meditation, spirituality. Um, and another avenue for that is like hard neuroscience and w- looking at um, 
uh, neurons and things. But I think the intersection of those is, is one of the more magical bits of like, how are we, um, you know, oh, we can study these neurons and how they're reacting. But then if we give that rat drugs and then study the neurons, we get even more information. Um, but the, I remember that one of the, one of the sessions, the guy had up a list of, um, like things that could happen in your life that would produce these like, you know, out of, you know, really, um, huge reactions from an emotional consciousness kind of level. And he's like, yeah, look down this list. Almost all of them are unreproducible. It's like the death of a loved one or, you know, marriage or whatever these like, these like big, uh, the birth of a child, these like big moments in life that are very difficult to study. And then one of them is like a, a religious conversion. And then one of them is, you know, magic mushrooms. Like, well, this one's pretty easy to study. <laughs> I, I think there's going to be another pillar, um, where you can muck around with AI perhaps. Absolutely. And, uh, we'll set aside the ethical concerns at the moment, but <laughs> you know, you, you could then essentially simulate, um, things sort of at scale, you know, AB tests things yeah. very easily. And you just literally cannot do that. Um, you can't like boot up separate versions of you and have them experience different things and then study the results in terms yeah. of the subjective reports or anything like that. Um, yeah. So another name that we tossed around is Graziano. Yeah. I, I actually, I really like his approach. I don't think it's complete, but I do think it's a very sort of like a mechanistic or engineering based yeah. approach. It's, it gets at the Anil Seth thing of like, it, if you're, if you're thinking about those in, Actually, now that I'm thinking about this, this is a really good way to have those, con you know, we've talked about the levels of consciousness of like, um, panpsychism and maybe your, maybe your cells and your electrons in your, in your atoms in your body are conscious at a certain level. Um, but that's like not that interesting of a problem in, in terms of what we're trying to understand, right? It's like, ultimately you do have constraints from these like deep physics and biology levels that, that change how you, who you are. But it's also, you have, like he was talking about homeostasis and reproduction and all these different systems. And I think these guys kind of get at some of those things that are more close and maybe more precious and more interesting to me. Yeah. So, um, Graziano has two books that I think were influential to both of us. The first one, I cannot remember the title, but it's it was consciousness and the social instinct or yeah. the social brain. Let me look it up. It was sort of like, perhaps consciousness uh, didn't sort of evolve as a, as a sort of personal narrative device or way of sort of um, understanding how we subjectively experience the world, but rather theory of mind evolved in order to sort of predict what others might do, because that's super evolutionarily advantageous. Yeah, it's con and, consciousness in the social brain. And once I like project on you that, oh, you might be feeling sad because you're crying and that might influence your behavior in the future or something like that. If it's a sort of a predictive thing of the world around me and then I say, well, wait a second, I kind of look like this guy. <laughs> so maybe when I'm crying, I'm sad. You know, you, you basically take that so outward social intelligence and you sort of push it back in yourself. Yeah. Um, I think that, and then the second book, he basically says, wait a second, this is actually not like the most basic way to look at this. And he looks at more from like an information perspective and model building perspective, which is sort of like even underneath the social perspective. And it really appeals to me because number one, it kind of does give you a blueprint for how you would build a conscious AI um, for better for worse. I think bo both of these books do. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think secondly, to me, it, g it gives one of the best ways of dismantling the fact uh, the the concept of the hard problem, which is to say that if you are really convinced in qualia, like you have this conviction that an apple is red, you know, the pain of a pinprick, all the subjective experience, you're very convinced that it exists to the point where some people say is the only thing you can, could be convinced of. It's yeah. the only thing you have is the subjective experience, the sort of raw yeah. uh, qualia. But he says, well, wait a second, that's the ability that you're able to say that, that, that your opinion is that you have this qualia experience, that opinion is information mm. and information's in your neurons. So for you to even produce the speech, I see the redness of the apple, you have to have some information in your brain that that conviction that that is happening, that's in your neurons. How did it get in your neurons? Right? Well, I think people who really tug onto the hard problem, at, at some point the physics breaks down, right? Like then there must be some sort of like 
basically the underlying consciousness or the panpsychism and everything has to at some point interact with your neurons to give you that opinion. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you're maybe it's there, but you're utterly delusional about it, right? In some sense. But I think the fact that essentially, because you are have this conviction that you experience qualia, and yet that is just an opinion, like any other opinion, which is encoded <laughs> information in your neurons, kind of says something that like there must be a system in there that is making the redness of an apple seem very spooky and metaphysical. Yeah. Right. And so then it's like, why is everyone walking around with this idea that we have this metaphysical sort of qualia? Well, you can just dig into the brain mechanistically. You can sort of look around what parts of the brain might be doing that. And you can sort of narrow down where this uh, sort of metacognition and the sort of the spookiness could arise. Right. And you sort of come to this very easy conclusion that like, well, so his thing is the attention schema theory, yeah. where you basically have this, uh, you know, you have sort of your base, base neural processes, and then you have this stuff that sort of monitors how your attention is being diverted. And uh, that, there has to be sort of a limit to like, you know, sort of the, uh, the recursive nature of looking back into your own computation in some sense. There is always a point. Let me use GPT as an example. So if you ask GPT, like, why did you say that? It'll give you an answer. But its answer is just a story. And then if you say, well, why did you give that answer as, as your thing? It'll give you another story. So it's just stories on stories, but it's the same <laughs> neural process. It's never going to yeah. say, oh, because neuron you know, 20 million right. had this value and the ReLU didn't cut it off and it, and it leaked through. Like, it has no access to that. In a very similar way, there has to be at some point where we don't have access to sort of the raw ongoings of a brain. And so that's why it looks spooky, because we have no way of sort of understanding at the highest level, uh, sort of the, these sort of like schema yeah. neural parts of our brain that are sort of, you know, kind of coming. I think he, he makes sort of this uh, analogy with like the, um, the dashboard of your car. Like it's the part of your brain that's sort of the dashboard of your car. It's sort of saying like, okay, your, your engine is this RPM and you have this much fuel. And it's sort of like a basic abstraction of the ongoings of your brain. But there's nothing on top of that. And so it might seem super spooky. Right? It might seem super metaphysical or ethereal or detached even from your body because you don't have another thing on top of that that's sort of, uh, yeah. you know, charactering that, right? So that, to me, is a very um, compelling and, like, very, like, mechanistic or engineering perspective. But it makes a lot of sense why we have these opinions. Basically, at the end of the day, any, um, any like, philosophy or explanation for the hard problem or consciousness in general that you, have, that you can make you must always, it must always lead to the conclusion there must be a bunch of people walking around convinced of the hard problem. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, I, and so I think that one does like a really good job in a very simple fashion. Well, and let me take, uh, so one of the things that I found most compelling about, so again, you know, Graziano, and particularly in the conscious and the social brain, which I think resonated with me more, um, he talks about this attention schema um, theory. And he says in the beginning of the book, and it's funny because I think this has kind of been my intro into consciousness. He's like, I just assumed that everybody thought about how the mind worked in this exact way. And I was explaining it to someone one day and they're like, that's crazy. You should write a book about it. Like, that's not how everyone thinks about it. And, I, you know, that's kind of like a meta <laughs> telling thing about how the mind works. But so he starts into attention schemas by talking about schemas in general. And this has become like such a powerful concept in thinking about how the mind works and my mind works, which is, you know, a schema being something like, um, he, he talks about a body schema or a body plan schema, which could, you know, people also call like proprioception. So you close your eyes and you know exactly where something is in your body. And you can kind of like, um, modify this and change this. So if you put on a really tall hat and you're at a party and you keep bumping it, you'll kind of like modify your body schema. So you know where that hat is, or if you have like a stick in your hand, and someone taps that stick, you can actually feel where it was on the stick that it was tapped, not just like that the stick was touched. You sort of can extend this schema beyond your own body. Um, there's also a trick he talks about where if you put something that's vibrating on your elbow as you're touching your nose, you will have the uncanny feeling that your nose is growing like Pinocchio. I think it's called like Pinocchio experience, right? And I, I, one thing I like is when, when you're driving a car and you hit a pothole, even though it doesn't hurt you, it's not going to hurt you. I feel like I'll flinch. You say, ouch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, a car's another good one, right? You like you you're noticing the size and the scale of your car. Well, 
there's a bunch of other kinds of schemas that we have. So, I, you know, I've noticed if like you are, you have your eyes closed and, you know, maybe you're like feeling a little woozy or something and like, you're like, where's the floor? The, the room is spinning and you open your eyes and immediately the schema of your physical space takes shape and it's unshakable. Like you could not convince someone that the wall is not where it is because you've, you've developed. And in fact, you, these schemas are so entrenched that like you can think about, you know, your grandmother's house that you visited growing up or your old elementary school. And you can put yourself in your, that space and walk through it. And you understand you, you've like hardened that schema, uh, into, uh, a space that you can revisit. Right. And so the attention schema is really just saying that we're paying attention, not just to say the locations of things, but to the mental states of other people. And that by paying enough attention to how, what other people are paying attention to, I find myself in the middle of that. And so some of the evidence that he gives for this is that, you know, some of the areas that seem to affect um, consciousness most are, is this like TPJ area. He talks a lot about this, where this area is also very correlated with like social things, with time, with schemas. Tem temporal parietal junction. Temporal parietal junction, Something I believe, like yeah. That. And interestingly, so at the conference last year, my, my favorite aha moment that I'm sure no one thought was interesting but me was these guys were giving a lecture and they were talking about dissociative drugs, um, ketamine, nitrous oxide, which they say are kind of like indistinguishable. And they're talking about the different um, eff the effects on different sort of brainwave patterns. And some of those patterns go down as expected. So like they're, they're comparing it to like propofol and some other classic anesthetics. Some of them go down, but then with dissociative drugs, they there's like, I think it's the gamma waves that like tick up really, really heavily instead of going down. And they're, those are focused directly on the TPJ. That's like where it's happening. Mm. And, um, you know, I just went up there and I was like, do you think this would explain some of the subjective effects of these drugs, which is sort of like a disconnection perhaps from the self while still being very conscious of certain things like your attention schema connection is loosening a little bit which is allowing you to sort of like create insights and maybe see the world in a little bit of a different way. Um, so be interesting to see if people are pushing on those things and trying to connect the dots between some of this stuff and the, the, the neuroscience. I mean, also like, you know, we know that a lot of those drugs have very powerful antidepressant qualities. And so it'd be, I've heard of uh, depression called like a, a consciousness disorder. Yeah. So I will, I'm no, I'm not a part of any of that research, but I, I love to see how it all shakes out. Oh, I'll show the uh, the Graziano book too. This is the one. Uh, I think this is Ben's favorite of the two uh, Graziano books. He it's also, a short read. He yeah. also, by the way, is uh, has written a bunch of fiction, and I keep wanting to read it. He's just like they. they sound, oh, really? Yeah, it sounds <laughs> it sounds really interesting. Um, especially if like this is the you know paradigm that he's using for that. Um, that it's kind of like you know sci-fi vibey, like it's like a. Um, experimental world kind of stuff it seemed like interesting um okay should we talk about solms now yeah so i i think that this is solms uh book i don't know if he's i'm sure he's written other stuff i don't know but this is his consciousness kind of like we might want to put it like this yeah, there because you go. <laughs> i think it's preferentially going to um, be on our uh, ai focus on our face <laughs> i think i said that um so why I think this is complementary is because it, it's one thing for Graziano to say, as I try to explain, maybe poorly, maybe okay, like that it's going to feel spooky and ethereal, like yeah. the quality, of the, the redness. It's going to be very hard to explain like color to a blind person or whatever. But it, it doesn't really get at why it feels like something. Yeah. Right? And so the, why does it feel like, what does it feel like to be a bat? Well, Notice we use the word feel, right? So yeah. I feel like Psalms really hits like, why does it feel, why does consciousness feel like anything? Why does qualia feel like something? And he sort of, um, he does this pretty cool like reductionist argument where he says like, okay, here's a person missing this part of their brain that we thought was uh, responsible for consciousness. They seem to still have like this yeah. uh, subjective experience. Here's a person missing an uh, even bigger part of their brain. They still claim to have subjective experience and so forth and so forth. Um, and basically says the feeling of consciousness itself is sort of this extremely ancient part of our brain, like sort of in the brainstem. That's, I guess, the hidden spring, right? Is this yeah. sort of like this base feeling, these very ancient signals that, of course, we're metacognating on over and over, right? Um, and creating like 
it's not just love that we're feeling like it's maybe jealous love or something like yeah. we have all these very complex stories from the sort of newer parts of our brain but at the end of the day the feeling at all of any of this stuff is from the very basic ancient parts of our brain and that to me is very compelling for really explaining the bigger picture of why it does feel so mysterious. Like I know, of course, you know, sort of the, the engineering perspective, well, we, we can't like look at the neural circuits sort of all the way down for like the highest levels of abstraction for like the attention schema, but why still then does it feel so powerfully real? Yeah. You know, to be alive and experience subjective things. Yeah, I, w I would say like there's this um, narrative that consciousness is a the new entrant in the space of you know biology that like only humans are conscious this is a prefrontal cortex thing this must be you know our, our newest most advanced part of our brain uh that's what is like what is consciousness right and solms is sort of saying that like consciousness is actually the most ancient part of the brain and i think an interesting way to think about this is kind of um I've for, for what it's worth i i kind of disagree with with it but i, I Maybe we'll oh, and too spicy. Okay, well, we'll we'll get into this. So here's here's what I think, right? Is that like the second that you become as an entity? So think of an ancient animal, right? You become not just unicellular. You have like uh, you have a front and a back, right? You have, and these are some of the oldest parts of our you know biology. As you watch like um, cells develop, like babies develop or whatever, right? You have a front and a back. You have bilateral sym symmetry. You have like a, a mouth and an anus you have like you, you need to direct your attention towards certain things where's the food where's the thing that i'm supposed to pay, pay attention to so now you have these scarce um this scarce commodity which is attention what do you what are you supposed to pay attention to and so you need like signal that's going to direct those those things right and as uh, the creatures get more and more advanced those become more and more complicated but for each one it has to exist at service of the previous one right like you have to continue. So if, if, if in the beginning it's just eat and reproduce, then you have to like that next layer up has to work completely in service of that. So it's a new motivation. Let's say play or say communication or maternal care or whatever. Each of those actually just has to build on top of the, the, the previous ones. And, you know, just as, a, as an example, um, Solms leans a lot on this um, researcher in effective neuroscience, Jacques Ponsep, and he talks about the maternal care instinct coming from the sexual instinct and they're like well this is not a very fun palatable thing for us to think about as a culture but obviously this is i mean they work on the same neurochemicals and very obviously this is would need to be the case like reptiles don't care for their young they just like turtles drop the eggs and hope for the best right so in order for so it's like this has to become wrapped up as part of the um reproductive model and it so it uses some of those some of those same things, and so that that piece of that kind of like motivation chain um, is what ultimately you know is is where everything is driven from, and those things that are surfacing from those those motivations and those emotions are consciousness. That's what it's like to be a bat. I think that's what kind of Solms is saying. <laughs> yeah, my my point of disagreement is. Uh, you know, so he, I think it, it's, it's the, it's the sort of the brainstem children yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I, I take issue with. So he, he boils down to like, okay, can keep removing parts of the brain. And yet you have uh, people claiming subjective experience. Like there was a guy who had like almost all of his brain removed, but he still had speech production uh, part of his brain. So he was able to answer questions like, of course I experienced this. <laughs> and of course, when you remove that, then they can't respond. So it actually reminds me, Graziano has these thought experiments where you put on this like Speechatron 2000 or whatever onto like a frog and you ask it like, do you experience things? And I think, I think that thought experiment is fraught with peril because language it might actually be special as yeah. we're finding with AI, for example. But I think that when you have uh, a kid with literally nothing but a brainstem, and you take them, I mean, they're, you know, they're blind, they're deaf or whatever, but you But take, interestingly, not dead, right? If right. You, if you, if they're you very much the, alive. If you take they're away the brain alive. stem, they're, they're yeah. toast. Um, you know, you take them to Disney World, and they're experiencing very strong emotions, clearly. Uh, that I don't disagree with. But are they experiencing consciousness? Uh, no, because I think emotion and consciousness are actually different. Yeah, I, do, they, do they have an attention schema? Exactly, Probably not. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So this is why I think 
Um, I think that the two stories are complementary, but they do conflict at a point. Because I think Graziano would say, well, they don't even have a TPJ. Like, so, you know. Yeah. So they, I think if, you know, if they did, they would definitely have the feeling of consciousness. Yeah. But I think consciousness itself requires some extra mm. layers. Yeah. So maybe it's sort of like, you know, Solms is kind of saying that the um, emotions that we have are the substance of consciousness, yeah. but that the, um, the, like this attention schema, this social network, maybe even language is the thing that we surface consciousness into to experience it the way we do as humans. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you could, you can redefine consciousness, uh, in a way that, you know, these children with only brain stems have, but at that point, I think you're sort of like, I don't know, mudding the waters a bit. I think consciousness like should be this, um, high level interpretation of our feelings essentially. Yeah. Like, and so it, it, this is this is the issue with, with these things, right? Like you can define a way your position to be correct by redefining everything. Yeah. But I think consciousness for most people's definitions, subjective experience and neural correlates would preclude uh, basically these children with no brain tissue yeah. being conscious. So that's sort of where I'm like, okay. But I think actually it's, it's a really clarifying point in fact. And I, and I really think that also this this sort of preponderance on like the emotional aspect really does hammer in the idea of why it feels like something to be me yeah. or would feel like something to be a bat but maybe not feel like something to be a fish right or yeah. or, or a child born with no brain so so in one 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 way that i like to think of that was my own analogy or my own metaphor or whatever that came out of hidden spring that um just hardened as I, as I read it was thinking about the, um, our minds as kind of like a phone. So if you think of the, you know, at the heart of your iPhone, when you buy one, it's like a, a fancy computer and it's got a screen, but it's got like a lot of like really great hardware underneath, right. That enables you to do lots of things. And then you have apps that you are actually the meat and potatoes of what you do on your phone. Oh, I'm going to download Google Maps and I'm going to download, you know, and, and there's core things to the phone and the OS, but then there's there's new things that you add on. And it kind of was like, that's sort of what it started to feel like to me is that these emotions are actually the operating system on which everything has to run. You know, one of my favorite uh, quotes is like, emotions are the indexes of our, or the index of our memories. I forget, I think it's from one of these dudes, actually, I don't remember where. <laughs> but the all of our memories, everything that we, we do is like impressed upon us because of an emotional experience. This is the, this is the processing unit. Uh, this is the CPU that all of our memories and things have to travel through. It's how things get written to memory. It's how things get, get validated. And then, but we have all these new apps, you know, which include like, you know, physical modalities, see, sight, touch, smell. Um, but also, you know, our confabulators, our attention schema that, that, uh, uh write, information to um to that conscious self and so i think you know interestingly this might be a way of thinking of ai as not conscious in a certain way where it's like it's has all of the apps but none of the none of the pro none of that core processing unit it doesn't have any of those like core emotions and desires which are actually the things that make you conscious even though you need both of those layers um yeah i mean okay so I, I think this is an interesting point that could be a whole nother um, podcast subject. But, you know, I've made the claim that I think, you know, children born with only a brainstem, so no brain tissue whatsoever. I don't think they're conscious in sort of any way that we've, uh, you know, have defined consciousness. Now, the, the reverse might happen with AI, right? Where there's sort of all the brain tissue except for the brainstem, yeah. right? And then the question is, do we define that as consciousness either? Because they they might be the philosophical zombies, which we haven't talked about, by the Ooh, way. Oh yeah, yeah, we should get into philosophical zombies. Yeah. So, the yeah the philosophical zombie is the person who uh, looks, acts, behaves exactly like we do, and yet have no inner subjective experience. And I think this is a Chalmers thing too, right? That comes directly out of the hard problem conversation. Yeah, I, I believe so. And again, I think this is sort of damaging to the cause. <laughs> this argument. Because um, I, I think Sean Carroll that sort of always points out a yeah. philosophical zombie is a big liar. 
They're a big <laughs> liar because guess what? When they stub their toe, they go, ow, that hurts, right? Because we've defined them as acting exactly like we yeah. would. And But why do they say, ow, oh, that hurts? Are they lying? Well, they're not lying in the sense that they're not deceiving us, right? Because that also, again, they're defined to act and behave yeah. uh, and sort of do neural processes like exactly like us. So they must be sort of lying to themselves in a way that they can't even realize. So it leads to you this very quick conclusion that uh, we all could be zombies and and yet be fully convicted that we have qualia, right? right? We, it must which, be the which, case. Which is no different than actually having qualia because that is the th ineffable <laughs> exactly, thing, right? Exactly. It, it, this reminds me of the, um, I forget where I saw this, it was like somebody kind of debunking um, I think it was a comedian and he was talking about uh, conspiracy theories and this guy was like, yeah, you know, they faked the moon landing. He's like, oh my God, that's so great. Like they must've saved so much money on like all, all the, like the, the teams of scientists and stuff that they would, oh no, no, they, they still had to hire all those guys. <laughs> oh, but they wouldn't have had to build the buildings and like create all these like government institutions. Oh no, they needed to do that. And they wouldn't have had to like create a rocket that could launch up. Well, no, they needed to put a spectacle, you know, this is like, Pretty soon you realize that like you had to do all these different things. It's like the only way to get the sense of conscious experience, I would wager, is to actually have that. It's like way cheaper than to sort of have some what magical fucking Descartes like pineal gland demon guy who's like making you say all those things. Like w what kind of dualistic world is that if you're, if you're behaving as though you have consciousness, but you don't actually have it. Like consciousness I is the mechanism through which you do it. I, I, I love that. I, I think that's a really nice way. I, I think also Shankar had a similar one where he's like, well, if aliens are looking down on the earth and they're just watching us, uh, <laughs> and let's say they're zombies, they would come up with an idea of consciousness because it would be really um, useful to predict and yeah. explain what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe we should actually take a slight step back. So the zombie argument, what is, this, what is the purpose of the zombie argument? The zombie argument is to try to get you to imagine a uh, sort of uh, a world that functions exactly the same way, you know, nuts and bolts wise, like we're, we're having this podcast, you know, in the yeah. same way. And yet the are sort of our inner subjective experience is dark. And I think we've, I think this has been dismantled many times in different ways, including by us just two seconds ago, but it is again, trying to imbue uh, a spookiness to the hard problem it's trying to define in a way that's uh, sort of makes it a hard problem. Yeah. Right. So, but yeah, it's, it's in some sense, a nonsensical premise, right? When you say, and this is true with the married, the color scientist, which I don't know if we have time <laughs> to get into, but like we, it, it, it's sort of your premise uh, sort of presupposes something impossible. Yeah. And then when your conclusion is also impossible or like mystifying, you know, you're like, wow, that's deep. But it's it's actually just like, yeah, it's, it's not a good premise. And it's a demonstration of kind of the toxic, um, you know, meme like culture of being a human, which is that like, you know, I was I always joke about like Ted being ideas worth spreading. It's like, well, what about the ideas that aren't worth spreading or that don't you know, that, that aren't very compelling, but that are just as important. And I think that like we it's so easy for these ideas. It's like, Oh, ooh, but what if it was a philosophical zombie? Like you can, it's so, it's so much easier to explain that it is to debunk. I actually, one of my favorite podcast episodes of all time was this, uh, radio lab. And they, it was this, um, magician guy or this guy whose grandparents were magicians. And they had this magic trick that was on the radio, like in the twenties or something. It's like early days of radio. I mean, it was later than the twenties. And they would, it was like, they were demonstrating kind of the remote, um, connection of like oh they could broadcast from anywhere so the wife would fly somewhere far away and then they would call her and the and the husband was like the magician guy in us in a room and he would like someone would write down a note and he would transmit it to her telepathically and she would sort of read it out right and this they're doing like podcasting like what do you think could have happened you know oh my god this is so interesting you know they're doing like the classic like and the podcast tropes and then and so then they like are just like guessing the guys like got all, all of his theories that was the grandson and then, so then they get Penn Jillette on and he's like, how, and he's like, how did they do this? And he's like, oh, I know exactly how they do it. And he's like, what? He's like, well, I mean, I don't know exactly what they did, but I can give you five different ways that I would have done it. And he's like, but you don't want me to explain it because it will ruin the joke. And he's like, magic tricks don't taste, don't, don't stay secrets because they um, are actual secrets. It's just because they're hard to explain. 
like everybody wants this, the answer to be like, oh, it was a mirror. It was this thing. And it's like, actually, oh no, there was a little bit of wire here and a tape here. And then I like did this really quick sleight of hand. Like that's what magic is. It's just like too hard to explain. And I think often that's where some of these like consciousness things get into. It's like the thing that's meme the thing that's like very easy to like, like drop in a conversation um, in two minutes. That's the thing that gets spread around. That's the hard problem as opposed to like talking more meaningful and about stuff that's like much muddier, like, you know, the correlation between these two, these two guys. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good point. I think, I think people are biased to, um, you know, want there's to be something mysterious, yeah. uh, you know, to be conscious, uh, conscious entity. Um, I wanted to say one last thing about, I think we should wrap up here in a second, but I want to say one last thing about hidden spring that I thought was super fascinating by the end, which is that he basically, and I've wanted to follow up on this cause he said he's like starting to work on this, but he says that not only is, does he think consciousness is simulatable, but that it must be in order to prove this theory to be correct. And that consciousness could be, and this is maybe my spin on it, but that there's like a hello world, like very simple version of consciousness, which is like maybe like the game of life, um, uh, Wolfram Alpha thing or whatever, um, Stephen Wolfram thing, where it's like, you know, you have this like very simple thing that doesn't have the complexity of a human, but is like making choices based on uncertainty, based on emotions or whatever. Um, so supposedly they're working on that, um, which I think is really cool. And it's like demonstration. Wait, does, doesn't Graziano also have an outline at the end of um, rethinking consciousness about building a uh, conscious AI? Oh, maybe. See, and we should. Maybe both okay, let's get project. both of these guys on the podcast. We'll just be like, hey guys, how can we? <laughs> <laughs> how can we help Sounds you good. guys work together and, and do this? But I think it's like, it's interesting that these two things would be sort of orthogonal, right? If you have that, you know, you have the, the GPT like train going, which is like very much a part of humanity, right? And then we have this like Solm's like emotional train and it's like, where would those two meet up, right? And that, mm -hmm. that's going to be, and, and inevitably I think people will want to simulate human agents, you know, in AI. And in order to do that, you're going to need to sort of like wire these up somehow, which is, I guess, scary and fraught in all sorts of ways. Yeah, <laughs> I think, you know, and adding emotions to, you know, chat GPT, like explicit sort of emotions, like it, it, you start, I think you very quickly get into these ethical quandaries. Yeah. And I've heard like very convincing arguments why we should never um, build an AI that at least is capable of suffering. Right, because now then we could do suffering sort of at an unimaginable <laughs> scale. Yeah, and even these proto AIs. Yeah, there's a whole can of worms here that we could get into, but I I am also in in agreement like that. Basically, any of these mechanistic or engineering type um, explanations for AI have to also admit, I think, uh, the ability to to build one from scratch. And if you can't do that. Then maybe there is something special about the like the mush up here. Yeah, right? uh, maybe you know Penrose is right about the quantum you know stuff. The what are the nanotubules or whatever you call it? <laughs> microtubules. microtubules, quantum microtubules. We're gonna hear all about it again. I'm sure. Yeah, he's gonna be at the <laughs> conference. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks for joining us for episode two of ConCon. Con. Uh, you can find us at ConCon.show. As of now, <laughs> I think we have a website up uh, and we'll be working on, you know, doing other stuff, I guess, in the future. Yeah. And maybe we'll have guests. Um, and maybe we'll have guests. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Thanks.